This is a practice talk for the R25 workshop on energy balance models. I want to begin with some philosophy. Um, how many of you have heard this uh, quote by George E.P. Bach? All models are wrong, but some are useful. So what's interesting about this quote is, first of all, it's made by a statistician. And um, it's actually stated to, to me, I've never heard it until I was in the field of obesity, but it's stated to me several, been stated to me several times. And usually in the context of um, comparison of m different models uh, developed by different individuals. And um, I've not seen the connection of what this comparison has to do with this statement. So I actually went and did a little digging of where the statement came from and what he meant. You know, what did he mean by the statement? So uh, if you read, um, there's plenty on George Box on Wikipedia, but if you read a little bit about what he meant by the statement, he says, now it would be very remarkable if any system existing in the real world could be exactly represented by any simple model. However, cunningly chosen par parsimonious models often do provide remarkably useful approximations. So what he meant by this statement was that all models are essentially approximations of the real world. And some of those approximations are useful to us because they tell us something or give us insight about the real world. So that's what he meant by this statement. Um, this statement is important for modelers work, working with biologists because I believe there's sometimes a, a misconception that a good model is one that includes all reality as possible but that's actually in so there comes a balance point where you may not want to include more things because the model itself will not give you anything more useful um, and it, it depends on the situation so for example uh, um, I can give you a situation where you want as much reality as possible and um, that is to track the path of anthrax that's been deliver deliberately released into the air then you would want to use the very difficult Navier-Stokes equations, which are uh, which model the atmosphere, and make sure that you have this correct, because you really need to know what the path of this anthrax is, because the path could be deadly. However, um, if you wanted to predict the weather tomorrow, it's the same set of equations. Using an approximation for the Navier-Stokes would be okay, because in a short-term uh, approximation, the weather is weather predictions are fine there's not it's not a life or death situation I prefer actually this quote by uh, one of my favorite mathematicians um, I mentioned that George Box was a statistician which is why I wouldn't have heard this uh, quote before because mathematics and statistics are related field but they're usually not um, over, they don't overlap each other. Sometimes mathematicians teach statistics classes, but in my department, for example, we have card-carrying statisticians that teach all the statistics classes, and I would not be um, privy to some of the statements made by statisticians, but I am, uh, I was a pure mathematician, so one of my favorite pure mathematicians said truth is much too complicated to allow anything but approximations. And this quote was made by John von Neumann, who was a um, pure mathematician, began the field of set theory. He's one of my favorite mathematicians because I often quote him stating that in mathematics, you don't understand things, you just get used to them. Think about that statement for a bit because the math that you know best is the one that you've used the longest. Um, and John uh, von Neumann, I, I left off his beginning of his quote uh, because I didn't like it. Um, he said, young man, comma, in mathematics, you don't understand things, you just get used to them. I think that we can say that things have changed since John von Neumann's time, and we can delete the young man and let it be directed towards anybody. I would rather say that all models rely on a set of assumptions. These assumptions are usually simplifying assumptions or approximations of our real world. And that might be a much more boring and less catchy statement, but that's really what this is about. Whenever someone makes a model, they have a set of assumptions. And then you have to test in what situations do those, do those assumptions make sense and when do they hold. For example, um, in physics, 
often they make the assumption for the first models of physics and Newtonian motion that there's no friction. Obviously, if they take this uh, model with no friction and then they apply it to build a space shuttle um, or a plane uh, or anything that we might be using that needs to be more carefully done, then assuming there's no friction might be a devastating assumption to rely on. However, in the case, if you ever took a physics course, the case where they assume that there's no friction, um, they do learn so much from those models. So they give us insight. At least for that class, you have some insight into the laws of motion. One is the beautiful pendulum equation, which is often talked about at the beginning of the class. Um, I love that. Um, if you have taken a differential equations class, um, we have these mixing problems that people love to assign as homework. And in those problems, they all say assume that the solution is, is instantaneously mixed. What that means is that the solution um, that you're putting together doesn't have time to kind of, you know, if you put sugar and then you pour water over it, it's going to take some time for the sugar to dissolve. The assumption is that sugar is dissolved instantaneously. It makes the solutions tractable for someone in the differential equations level and it gives us some insight into that application. If you haven't taken a differential equations class or you haven't taken um, a physics class, well, um, you make approximations all the time. When we drive our car, I can tell you right now that when I leave my house is dependent on the time that it takes me, um, you know, when I leave my house, I, I do have an approximation in my head that I'm going to be driving a certain speed and um, that speed is usually constant. So for example, if I was going to drive from Birmingham to Tuscaloosa, I would say, you know, 60 miles per hour, I'd start, start to do some math in my head and estimate how long it's going to take me to get there. So um, in this case, we're making an approximation that, that we're driving at this constant speed. Is that reality? No because it's going to take me time to get out of the parking lot. I'm going to be slow for a while. If I'm on the interstate, I might be going above 80, uh, 60 miles an hour, I say 80 miles an hour. Um, if I see a cop, I might slow down. So this is an approximation of what really happened, but it does give me insight and an estimate to how much time it's going to take there. So everybody does this. So that gives you an idea of an assumption. Now, if you assume, make this assumption and there was construction on the road, uh, it throws everything off because your assumptions are no longer valid. You're no longer driving even close to 60 miles an hour, so it'll probably take you a lot longer to get to Tuscaloosa. Do models need assumptions? So um, why do we need these assumptions in the first place? Well, if you say a what if of everything and put that into that example I just gave you, where you're driving from Birmingham to Tuscaloosa, if you try to include every possible scenario, you get something that doesn't really, you, it's intractable. So it won't be usable or applicable for any, what you need it for, which is just to get a rough estimate of how, to, how long it will take you to get to Tuscaloosa. We call that mathematically intractable. So there must be something to be gained from your model. And if it's so unwieldy and burdensome, you won't be able to get anything from it. You learn nothing. You explain nothing and you change nothing. In the models that I'm talking about today, we use them to try to uh, facilitate change in patient behavior. So again, we want something from this model, and it really depends on what we want. So um, in each of these three things, we want something, and if something's so burdensome, it's not gonna happen. So it's important before I begin this presentation, and maybe you should keep this in mind for many of the other presentations, what is what constitutes a good model? What do we want from a, a model? And this actually, these criteria, I've actually been thinking about this quite a bit because um, you know, we look at the difference between curve fitting and a differential equation model. Those two things in my mind are very different. Articulating how they're different is very difficult for me. So good for me, McCleary, who is a uh, biologist who is studying eating rates in animals, came up with four criteria that define or characterize a good model. What's interesting is these four criteria were also talked about um, by Batzel, Bacher, and Kappel, three mathematicians, on a book on mathematical modeling and physiology. First, the model should predict. Well, that's usually the basic of what you want from a model, that it should predict, but beyond the observed data. So you want some time point that's 
further than what you see. The model should be as simple as possible without challenging criterion one. You don't want it to fail and be so crappy that it doesn't work for criterion one, but you don't want it to be so unwieldy or even further unwieldy than it should be um, because you can gain more the simpler the model looks. It should tell you something. There should be something that you get from doing this exercise, some mechanistic insight beyond what we see in the data. My husband makes fun of me because I came up with a model for circadian rhythms that showed that if people, uh, if individuals, if it's dark individuals are sleeping and if it's light individuals are awake. And he likes to make fun of me for that, but I told him that's not the final outcome of the model, but that's a, that joke is pretty funny because, you know, that's, what he was trying to say is your model's not telling me anything more that I do already don't know. So it should tell us something. The hardest thing that um, models have to satisfy is that it should be founded on some theoretical basis. There should be some reasoning as you're putting together this model. The term should mean something. They should have physical meaning. So if there's a deviation from the model, I should be able to pinpoint why that de deviation happened. Moreover, that model, because it's built on these, the model curve should be an outcome of this theoretical basis, not a fitting to this the to the um, data, but rather I have some series of constructs. I've described how the flow should happen, and then the curve that you get, a trajectory that you get, should be an outcome of this final process. Um, and it shouldn't result in nonsense predictions. For example, the 3500 calorie rule I'm going to show you can result in eventually having negative solutions. That's nonsense. So it's not based in theory. Something's wrong wrong with it in number four. Number four is one of the most difficult um, things to satisfy. And um, just because a model doesn't satisfy number four, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad model. Um, one through three still can tell us something. So um, just keep that in mind as you go too. So to give you a little overview of what I'm going to cover, I'm first going to start with the early history of weight loss prediction, which energy balance models are, um, are tasked to actually do. And then I'm going to give you the development of the first energy balance model, which gives it's more to give you a flavor of how these models are built and um, how, how they are connected together. And then I'm, there's a slew of other models. I'm going to show you, tell you a little bit about those other models. And then finally, we're going to test the models and see, see how they do. So let's start with that early history. That history is covered in a paper that I uh, co-authored with Steve Himesfield in the Journal of the American Dietetics Association. Um, and uh, in this, it's really nice because it has the mathematical history combined with the history, the biological history of when they made the first measurements, what they get gathered together, how they came to these conclusions, and where we are today. This is a really kind of a historical paper. The simplest model that was ever derived was derived by Max Wisniewski. And usually when we start any modeling exercise, the first thing to do to try is to try a line. So this is y is equal to mx plus b. And so um, here, in this case, W of t represents the weight, and Max Wisniewski used pounds a weight in pounds on day t. W0 represents the baseline weight before they started the intervention. <coughs> and delta EB stands for the change in energy balance in calories per day. So for example, if you cut your calories back in your food by 500 calories a day, this delta would be 500. So the task at hand for Max Wisniewski was to find M. What is the energy content of weight change, and the way he has it there, it's in pounds per ca uh, calories. See, the units have to all work. This is in pounds here, this is in pounds here, this is days, this is calories per day, so I need the calories to cancel, so I get pounds per calories. Unit analysis is very, very important. So here's the screenshot of the famous paper by Max Wisniewski. So it's really interesting. If you Google search this um, 3500 calorie rule, the first thing you get is the Mayo Clinic's use of the 3500 calorie rule. However, um, 
the second thing you get is that the the model is wrong. And so it's not necessarily wrong. Going back to my introduction, you know, there's a set of assumptions. Let's dig down a little deeper and find what these assumptions are. And you can see that one pound of weight loss is approximately 35 calories. So that's where he gets this M. The M he derives here is one over 35 pounds per calories, or if you have it in kilograms, it's one over 7,700. 7, so this is the first hit when I Google searched at home in Randolph, New Jersey, 500 calories because 3,500 calories equals one pound. So they're using Wisniewski's rule. What are the exact model assumptions here? Well, if I'm going to write down a linear model like this, the first is that this energy deficit, even as I'm losing weight, does not change. That means that I'm assuming that as my weight goes down, carrying around that same weight does not expend any less energy. We know it does, but he made the simplifying assumption that it does not, that on a short-term basis, it remains very uh, fairly constant. Really, that's what he's assuming, that it's negligible. The second thing he assumed is that the energy content of weight change is constant. In the paper that I wrote with Steve Himesfield, um, you'll find that this, in fact, is also a simplifying assumption. The third is this number, 3,500 calories per pound. He derived that using regression. And when you do that, you are focusing on the population that you are examining. That's, in his case, white females were the large percentage of the population that were undergoing very low calorie diets for a short duration, one to two months. So this energy con this number is valid in this population for that amount of time. So if we test this, I can test this, the actual change in weight versus the predicted change in weight by 3,500. Um, this is from the famous calorie study that was conducted at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center, um, very well controlled. And this is just one month. And you see that it's not terrible. It, it's um it's okay. Um, we do have some scatter, but this is the y equals x line. It's not awful. So for short term, it looks like it's doing okay. Long term, however, this is 84 days. You see that the actual change in weight is much, um, the predicted change in weight is much higher than the actual change in weight. Um, so that the 3,500 calorie rule is not uh, doing a good job a little bit down the line, which it, this is three months down the line, which it's starting to, the assumptions are not being held to. There's now friction. So now I'm going to ask you some questions. So let's start with the first question. Here's how this works. Take out your cell phone. It's not going to cost you anything. And what I need you to do, if you have a computer, you can also respond by computer. You go to this website if you're on a computer. Or you can text to this. This is the number that you're going to text, the 37607. So text to this number this message. And it will ask you to join and it will ask you to choose either A or B. So would we say here that the 3,500 calorie rule is wrong? Or would we say it predicts well for individuals undergoing short-term low-calorie diets? So you answer now. The second question, the 3,500 calorie rule or Wisniewski's model makes some assumptions. The big assumption is that either energy expenditures do change during weight loss or they don't change during weight loss. Which one is it, A or B? Okay, let's move now to the development of the first energy balance equation. And just for anyone looking at this, what this, what this ends up doing is that um, uh, students will type in their comment and a bar chart will go here showing 
what uh, on the side a bar chart will appear in real time so people can see how the answers as a group are coming in. So it allows the audience to interact with you during your talk. So let's go to the development of the first energy balance model. So to do this, um, I need to start with the energy balance equation. And um, this is uh, the model that I'm going to derive is based on a model by Vincent Antonetti that was developed in 1973 and published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Vincent Antonetti was way ahead of his time. He was an engineer who worked at IBM, had access to computers, and he told me that uh, there were two women who were talking about Weight Watchers at a party and uh, they were using the 3500 calorie rule at, in fact and he thought well surely you know the, the, there's some assumptions that could be you know further looked at in a very easy way and since he had access to computers he could numerically run the calculations but um, the way Vincent Antonetti thought is by using criterion 4 um, the first law of thermodynamics, which turns out to be the energy balance equation in humans, states that the rate of energy stores is equal to the rate of energy intake minus the rate of energy expenditures. And this is measured in, you can think of it as an energy, energy per day, calories per day for sake of ease to think about it. So um, the rate of energy stored, let's say I'm losing weight then um, I'm losing weight at, um, that's the change in weight per the change in day, uh, how much time has been covered, um, and how many calories that entails. So um, a certain amount of calories are being sloughed off my body per day, basically. So here's the energy balance equation again under Vincent Antonetti's favorite, uh, famous la landmark paper. We start out with ES equals EI minus EE. So let's take that term ES. Well, what is energy stores? Well, I know where I store my energy, right in my hips and my belly. But really, we can say weight is a proxy for that energy store. It's, if you've watched The Matrix, um, they were using babies as little batteries, right, inside their little pods. So the whole body is a energy store. So if I want to look at the change in energy stores, that's really the weight change per day. That's measured in kilograms per day. So the DW, DT, the D is the delta, delta weight over delta time, is the change in weight over the change in time, the speed of weight loss. What's that question mark? Well, the units have to work out. So for um, weight is measured in kilograms per day. But ES is calories per day. So I need to change this and transform it by a unit conversion to calories per day. And what Antonetti did is he said, well, 7,700. Wisniewski has that energy density for me. The kilograms cancel. And I have ES is equal to 7,700 DWDT. And that's now in calories per day, the right units. Energy expenditure can be broke up into many different pieces. And one thing Steve Heinsfield said to me once is there's 30 plus some differential equation models of the, uh, using the energy balance um, equation. And he, he asked me if it's true that the difference between all these models is really the way they cut up the energy expenditure pie. And that is indeed true. So the way um, Antonetti did this is he said, well, Energy expenditures comes from several different places. The first place it comes from is the thermic effect of feeding. How much is going to be the cost of digesting my food? And the second place it comes from is my physical activity. How much is it? And that would entail any, any activity. It glommed it all into one term, PA. And the final thing is how much energy it takes just to run your organs, resting metabolic rate, which I have down here. Each of these are measured in calories per day. And then he had to derive model terms on each one of these. So this is a very different approach. You can feel it now if you uh, have a statistics background than um, modeling using statistics. So here in the TEF, he said, well, I'm just going to assume that it's a certain percentage of my total intake. So if I eat more, it's going to cost me more energy to digest that food. And he did use this 0.10 times EI, which has been used by several other authors since. Physical activity, he said, well, that's going to be probably directly proportional to my body weight. 
Um, the bigger I am, the more it's going to take me, more energy it's going to take me to move around. Now, as my weight, body weight goes down during weight loss, I'm going to expend less energy. So this has re, uh, changed that simplifying assumption that was held to by Wisniewski's model. Resting metabolic rate, well, there's many resting metabolic rate models out there, regression models. So he said, well, what I'm going to take is my favorite regression model. At the time, there was really only Harris Benedict, and someone had derived another resting metabolic rate model based off of heat loss from surface, body surface area, which um, we're going to hear about later uh, in a talk later a little bit more in depth. And so that was initially the model he used. But uh, Antonetti and I uh, used Mifflin St. Jor, which is a linear regression model um, developed in the 1980s. Um, and it just is, you know, has a coefficient for weight, height, age, sex, and a constant term, and, um, and pop that in for RMR. So now I have basically the state variable is weight here and if you do this you can actually solve for the um, entire differential equation using techniques that we show technically in Calc 2 if you're on on target with your content delivery and if not then in a, in a first week of a differential equations course so Antonetti and I have both done this what Antonetti recognized also at the time is that uh, he would not be able to deliver his model. He's unique. He's sitting there at IBM in front of these huge computers. They were not on the desktop of everybody's house at the time. So he knew that he had to deliver this material in a different way. And so he has written a book with tables in them. So instead of going to a calculator online, you would go flip to the book of your height, your age, your gender, and how much your deficit is going to be, and it has your weight loss projections in there. So it's a beautiful book. Um, actually, it's a beautiful idea, but I thought, again, that he was way ahead of his time. I've never met him personally. We've just come, talked and collaborated over, by email. So this was the first of many models. What's interesting about all the other models is they were published in physics journals. Some appeared in engineering journals. Um, I, I think one appeared, I heard one appeared in the um, Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics in their education section um, to, as a teaching technique uh, tool for students. Um, one was uh, a series were published in math biology journals by um, a not very well-known mathematician by the name of Kazusku who just who just thought it was fun to work on these things. And so there's a series of other models. Today, probably the most well-known is the one by uh, Kevin Hall, um, published in Landsat, where he has a body weight calculator on the NIH website. And um, models that I have published with Corby Martin and um, Steve Heimsfield, Leanne Redman, and others um, have also uh, been used for different cases. So um, they're just more well known, but they're not the first one. Um, definitely not the last, probably not going to be the last one. In fact, someone's going to give a talk here where we had to develop an entirely new energy balance model. Again, it's what you need, what's the application you need, and will this version of the model work for what you need it to do? So I just wanted to give you a list of some of these um, papers. Uh, there's many, many more than this. Um, this is just a short list of other references. Um, they're all over the place. P some people were in the field of obesity. Some people were mathematicians. Um, Kazuska is very interesting. He's a very typical uh, mathematician who is uh, at a small college. Every college needs a mathematician to teach their math classes. So you will get mathematicians who just, and we just need paper and pencil and some time. So if you got some time and you're interested, you'll uh, mess around. So he was just messing around. Christensen also was a mathematician, but he collaborated with Sorensen, who is in the field of obesity. <clears throat> so how well do these models do? Well, you would think that the Antonetti model is so simple. It can be solved by, it should be solved by someone in a Calculus 2 class. I say could be because I just finished teaching and you learn on the final what could be done or should be done Maybe it will not be done, but so we would expect them to do that. And you see that the Lancet model, Paul's, and my model, they're all fairly similar in their validation. 
this is the validation um, on weight loss um, for the calorie study. The previous was weight gain using a, a study that was done in residence by George Bray called Proof. What's interesting is there's been several papers that have had this image in it. Uh, Antonetti's paper was the first that I know of, where they have the dynamic model predictions and they have the 3500, which is the line model predictions. And what you see is here, this is an individual from the calorie study. The blue curve is uh, our energy balance model predictions. The black dots are the individual weight loss, um, uh, weights of the person. And the line is the 3500. And as you would expect, you see that for a short term, at least 31 days, it's not that bad. It's not that far apart. But at 84 days, you start to see a gap of um, about four kilograms, which is about eight pounds. So it's, it's a quite a bit of a gap. Um, that gap lengthens as time goes on. And you see that at 400 days, this gap is now a substantial difference. And what happens eventually to the line is that if you keep it will keep going down eventually that line will be zero so we get nonsensical predictions I wanted to show you this the criteria of a good model and just look at it very carefully the model does it predict beyond the observed data it should be simple as possible does it give you mechanistic insight is it founded on a theoretical basis ask these questions Take a look at that. If you have to jot them down, because I'm going to ask you some questions next. So this is kind of an easy question. My second question. This one is all of the above, by the way, because um, 3,500 calorie rule fails criterion one for long-term predictions, but it's okay for short-term predictions. So criterion one is, recall, predicts beyond the observed data. The 3,500 calorie rule also fails cri uh, criterion four because it's not developed. You can actually uh, write down some simplifying assumptions and do an energy balance uh, development of it of the model, but eventually it gives you nonsensical predictions because eventually the 3500 calorie rule gives you negative solutions. It satisfies criterion one as long as model assumptions are satisfied. Short-term data, so it's true that C is true. So the answer to this one is all of the above. 